friends. Just a reminder that this event is being live streamed on Pendle Hill's YouTube channel and will also be recorded for people to view later on. If you do not want to be recorded, you can turn off your camera. Um, and we invite you to do so. That's your choice. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, friends, to this virtual space. Um, my name is Lori Pinero Sanitsky, and I am the new education coordinator here at Pendle Hill. Um, many of you know that Pendle Hill in Wallingford, Pennsylvania, on Lenape land, is a nearly 100 year old experiment in spiritual learning community. And our first Monday night lecture series is a beloved tradition through which we learn from teachers locally and internationally who share with us the work that they're bringing into the world and how spirit is alive for them in this moment. And today we have the privilege of learning from Drick Boyd. Uh, tonight's program is Against the Grain talking to white people about racism in a time of polarization. Will you wave to us, Drick? Um, Drick will share with us for about 30 minutes and this will be followed by a Q&A and I'll give you some more instructions about how we'll move through that Q&A a little bit later. Um, Want to tell you a little bit more about Drick in 2021. Two weeks after the January 6th attempted takeover of the U.S. Capitol building by supporters of former President Donald Trump, Drick Boyd released his latest book, Disrupting Whiteness, Talking with White People About Racism. And in the book, Drick proposes a particular dialogical approach to talking with white people in their personal, familial, and professional networks about issues of race and racism. However, Drick did not anticipate the gross and continued distortions of the facts of the 2020 presidential election and the attack on the Capitol. Drick Boyd is a professor emeritus of urban studies at Eastern University in St. David's, Pennsylvania, where he was a full-time faculty member for 22 years. He is the author, co-author of four books, including his latest, Disrupting Whiteness, Talking with White People About Racism published in 2021. He's an activist involved with Power Interfaith, New Conversations on Race and Ethnicity, New Corps, and the Restorative City Initiative. He has three adult daughters and lives with his wife of 43 years in Brumall, Pennsylvania. You're welcome to use the chat during Drick's lecture to send me or Anna Hill, the two Pendle Hill staff here, um, your questions that arise for you during the lecture, and we can ask those for you during the Q&A time later. A uh, reminder that this program is being live streamed and recorded. Um, and now I'm going to invite us into some waiting worship. And from the worship, Drick will speak to us. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I know there are lots of other things you could be doing tonight, on a Monday night. Uh, so I feel very honored that you took time uh, tonight to, to be here. And I see uh, some friends, uh, some former students, 
uh, some colleagues. Uh, so it's great to see you and all the rest of you as well. Uh, and I wanna, wanna say thank you uh, to the staff at Pendle Hill for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, I, have, uh, I, I, I am fortunate to live relatively close to Pendle Hill. Uh, and so I've, uh, over the years, I've, I've been in this area for 30 years and I've spent a lot of time uh, at Pendle Hill, sometimes taking all day retreats, sometimes just coming for the morning worship. Um, and while I'm not Quaker, uh, I have a great appreciation uh, for the Quaker tradition and its integration of contemplation of activism. So um, it's, it's really great for, uh, for me to be here. Uh, earlier today, I was uh, with about 85 other people at uh, a meeting uh, entitled uh, Creating a Culture for Reparations in Philadelphia. It's a four-day intensive workshop that's being sponsored by uh, combination of a group called the Truth Telling Project and the Interfaith Office of the of City of Philadelphia. And I just feel like uh, what I have to share tonight is kind of an overflow of that uh, as well. And it's a sign that the things we're talking about, I want to talk about tonight and what, what we were talking about earlier today in this workshop, um, there's, there's, there's something stirring uh, in our city and throughout our country uh, that we can no longer just look the other way or remain silent uh, about issues of race and polarization, but it's time for people of conscience and faith to do their part to engage in seeking to bring build bridges, uh, to bring healing, and to challenge those who, who might uh, do things that are destructive. This past week, we passed the two-year anniversary of the January 6th insurrection an attempted coup at the US Capitol. And while the insurrection was put down and many of those involved have been prosecuted or in the process of getting prosecuted for their crimes, including former President Trump, the lies that fueled that attack have continued to grow and fester. And this polarization, what has come to be called the big lie, has divided families, has destroyed friendships, has made reasonable discussion about social and political issues extremely difficult for a lot of people. School board meetings have become arenas for shouting matches about whether or not children should uh, learn about racism and uh, the history of racism and it's the heart of our, our US history. Teachers, school board members, principals have been threatened or fired. Books that Tell the stories of marginalized Americans have been banned in many of our schools. And all in all, in the name of preserving some mythical notion of American exceptionalism, there's just a lot of polarization. Um, you know, and the question for me is, you know, how do we as people of conscience, uh, many of us people of faith, who are committed to peacemaking and racial justice enter into and interact with people who are caught up in these polarized spaces. And more specifically, how do we confront the overt and implicit racism that causes so much dev devastation and division in our, in our society? That's what I wanna explore with you tonight. And I come with some ideas that I wanna share with you, but I also come with a lot of questions, which I hope we can uh, grapple with together. But before I jump into that, I need to step back a moment and tell you just a little bit about myself. You've kind of heard the official bio, but I think for our purpose tonight, uh, there's something I really feel uh, I need to share. You know, I, I've grappled with these issues uh, of, of race and, and diversity for much of my adult life. And Yet, I don't consider myself an expert in any form or fashion. When it comes to race and uh, racial justice, I consider myself a, a recovering racist. Uh, a recovering racist. That, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, it means that I'm a product of a family, a community, and a national cu culture that as I grew up, led me to believe that my experience as a white, middle-class, heterosexual male was the same, of every, same as everyone else in the society. I was raised to believe that the success I had in life was solely the result of my intelligent and hard work 
and had nothing to do with my race. I grew up believing that the education system, the criminal justice system, the government and other institutions in our society, while not perfect, operated generally in a fair and impartial manner, especially when it came to race. What I didn't realize until later in life was that the game was rigged in my favor when it came to race. And the whole system was designed for me to believe that those who did not succeed as I had were just a little bit more inferior. And that's why they didn't achieve. And this racist way of seeing the world and being in the world was bred for me by, from the day I was born by loving parents, by diligent teachers and other caring role models without my knowing, and in many cases, most likely without their knowing. I was like a child born into a drug infested environment. And I was bound to become addicted to the drug of white superiority. And much of my personal journey toward an anti-racist lifestyle has involved unlearning my privilege and my limited worldview and relearning a new way of being and living in the world. Now, I said I was a recovering racist. Some of you may have been involved in 12-step in movements or you're, you're familiar with 12-step movements like Alcoholics Anonymous or Gamblers Anonymous. And if you are, you know that when people complete the 12-step program, they never say they are cured. They never say they are recovered. Rather, they say they are in recovery or they are recovering. See, the genius of the 12-step movement is that it recognizes that one is never free of addiction, but instead one must continually work on their recovery because the minute they begin to think that they are cured, that they are over it, that they don't have to worry about it anymore, they begin to slide back into their addiction. And in the same way, while I've learned and grown a great deal in my understanding about my own racism and the racism in the world over the last several decades, I have been reminded more times than I care to count that I still have work to do. And so every time I make a presentation on race, like I'm doing tonight, I purposely turn the light on myself before I challenge others to look at themselves. So I in, invite you to explore some difficult issues with me, not because we are perfect or have it all figured out, but because we're on a journey to overcome our corporate addiction to racism as people in this society. Uh, Anna, you can put the slide up now. So this is my one advertisement for the evening. Um, is the book up? Yeah, there it is, okay. This is the book that uh, uh, was referred to, Disrupting Whiteness, Talking with White People About Racism. It's available uh, in paperback as well as in Kindle. And it's, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the book and what's in the book, but I also wanna talk about the story that sort of goes with the book as, as, I, as I wrote it. Um, and you can take, take that down, Anna. Thank you. So here's the story behind the book. In August 2017, hundreds of self-proclaimed white nationalists marched through the campus of the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, Virginia. And they were carrying lit tiki torches and chanting phrases like, white lives matter and you will not replace us and the Nazi inspired phrase, blood and soil. And counter protesters gathered to challenge their presence. And while some of those counter protesters were nonviolent, others were not. And so a violent confrontation quickly, uh, quickly emerged. And the police, uh, the Charlottesville police sort of stood off to the side and just watched all of this sort of begin to escalate. And eventually, after uh, it had gone on for quite a while, the police broke up the crowd and declared a state of emergency, only after several people had been sent to the hospital and one woman, Heather Heyer, had actually been killed being run over by a car. Now, following that event, I had a number of people, uh, students, coworkers, friends, people who knew that I had written about and taught courses on, on racial justice issues. And they were, they were saying to me, 
I don't know how to talk to my family. I, I don't know how to talk to my friends. I don't know how to talk to the people at work about the issues. People just don't want to talk about it. And most of the people who are asking these questions, I, I should say, were, were other white people like myself. And I, I started thinking about this and I, I, I have a blog. And so I started blogging about some of the things I was hearing people say and trying to offer some responses. And eventually those blogs became a book uh, entitled Disrupting Whiteness. Now the book lays out a challenge, especially to white people who are concerned about the rising tide of overt and covert racism to engage the white people in their families, in their social networks, in their workplaces, to have conversations about the racial issues impacting our society. And to do so, not in a form of debate, but in a form of dialogue. Now, in the first part of the book, I, I give an analysis of the problem, why it's so difficult for white people to have constructive and meaningful conversations about racial issues. My experience has been, and the experience of a lot of people is that when you're in white spaces, predominantly white spaces, and you bring up the topic of race, one of two things happen, one of three things happen. Either people just head the other way, or they change the topic, or they get really ticked off at you for even bringing it up. Um, and and there's some, there, there are things going on in white people's lives that make it very difficult. And I try to unpack some of the ways that that affects white people. And I also talk about the way racism manifests itself in our society. And there's even a chapter where I discuss how racism not only hurts uh, persons of color, but also hurts white people. And then in the second half of the book, I suggest that instead of getting in debates and arguments with people about racial issues, that we instead try to establish a dialogue that explores the stories behind why people think and believe and act the way they do around race. What is it that's going on with them and how did they come to, to see things that way? And in so doing, what we're doing is we're inviting people into a process of reflecting on their attitudes and their emotions around race and having a chance to kind of hear themselves talk. And as they hear themselves talk, perhaps begin to rethink why they think and believe the way they do. Now, this approach is not something that I, I uh, came up with myself. I've learned and practiced this as being part of a group called NUCOR, New Conversations on Race and Ethnicity, where once a month we, we gather together and we talk about issues of race and we try to practice this sort of dialogical approach with each other. And we've taken this to other groups and other institutions to kind of help them in their, in their work together to have a, a way to talk about difficult issues about race without it becoming just kind of a shouting match. And in the book, I also take up uh, different kinds of defenses that whites often put up when the topic of race comes up, anger, guilt, withdrawal, denial, fear, claims of colorblindness and more. And I share ways that we can address these bar barriers by asking probing questions designed to draw out the stories behind their emotions and their attitudes. And I talk about how we can even con constructively respond to acts or statements which, which are clearly racist, and not to, not to allow those things to go unchallenged, but to do so in a, both a humble and a loving way. And so in a nutshell, that's the focus of the book. It was prompted by events in Charlottesville, and I finished the manuscript two weeks before George Floyd was murdered. And after that tragic, death and the uprising and the marches that followed, I realized I wasn't done. So I went back to work and I tried to add section to help people engage with the issues being raised by the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Arbery and other people. The manuscript was finally finished in the, in the fall of 2020 and was sent into production. And if you've ever worked on a book, you know that you send it off and it's, it's kind of getting, it's on, I got a life of its own and it comes out when it comes out. So I was waiting for the book to be published, to be released. And then January 6th happened. And three weeks later, my book was released. Now, I don't know about you, but I did not see the Capitol on the attack coming. I did expect Donald Trump to challenge the results. And I was even part of a group that were called together to prepare for that possibility. So that was not a surprise. 
but a full scale attack on the Capitol by our militia and members of Congress seeking to overthrow the clear election results. Now that one was a surprise. And, and then the big lie started to grow and grow and at its root, it is a brand of white nationalism woven together with religious beliefs often that claims that white people in this country are somehow entitled to a way of life that denigrates and excludes other racial and ethnic groups. And at the heart of the big lie is a longing for a nation where white ways and white values are dominant, where people of color, African-Americans, Hispanic, Asian-Americans, undocumented immigrants and the like, must accept a second-class status in this society. The big lie is obsessed with what has been called the white replacement theory. This belief that, that somehow white people are gonna be overrun by people of color and that white values and white ways of thinking will be wiped away. There's no, there's no place for thinking about an inclusive society where no way of living, no sense of culture or values is excluded. That instead of being just one way, we're many ways that we can enrich one another and that all our histories can be shared. The white replacement theory says there's only one way and that's the white way. And that's why the big lie is so dangerous and insidious. It undermines and distorts the very best of what our nation can become. And for this reason, I believe it must be me opposed and turned back. And at its heart, the question I've been grappling with ever since my book came out for the last two years is as people of faith and conscience, what does it mean for us to resist racism and violence in a time of extreme polarization? I can't say I've got the, the clear answers to those questions, but I, but I do have some thoughts. And that's what I'd like to share with you. First of all, what, what is clear is that we are living in an era of increasing hostility which many people, and my, I'd be one of them, believe will only get more hostile and more intense as the participants in the January 6th attack are prosecuted, as former President Trump may himself be prosecuted, and as we move toward the 2024 election. And this hostility has caused many people, including me, to wonder, are we heading toward another civil war? Some of those who are involved in promoting the big lie have even called for civil war. And recent events suggest it could be a possibility. Dr. Barbara Walter, not to be confused with the recently deceased TV journalist, Dr. Barbara Walter is a professor at the University of California, San Diego, and she has written a book entitled How Civil Wars Start. She is an expert in international security issues and is part of an international consortium of researchers who study the forces that lead to civil unrest in nations around the world. She has consulted with the Defense Department, with the, the military, uh, with the State Department. She's, she's an expert in, in looking at what are the factors that lead to nations experiencing civil unrest. And in this particular book, she turns her insights as to what is happening in the United States and shows how since the election of Donald Trump, our nation has moved away from democracy toward a more autocratic form of government. And she points out how certain actions like the denial of the 2020 elections could be leading us to a new civil war. Now, while Walter herself holds out hope that we can prevent that, she says that if there were to be a civil war, it wouldn't be a regional war like the civil war in the 1860s. Rather, it would be more like a coordinated and well-organized war of attrition, uh, of attacks on prominent leaders and institutions that would disrupt the economy and our political system, knocking out of power stations and other 
uh, energy sources disrupting our normal pattern of life. And when I look at the attempted kidnapping of Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmore and the attack on Paul Pelosi, the husband of former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and even on the attack and those uh, power stations in rural North Carolina, I, I, I wonder, are, are, are these signs of something yet to come? Now, you may think I'm, I'm just kind of going off base, but something like a civil war could happen. And, and as we look at what's happening in the United States, even this last week in our House of Representatives, where they couldn't even decide who was going to hold the gavel to start the meeting. There is a small group of people in, in, our, in our government de dedicated to shutting our government down, making it dysfunctional. Now, obviously, I don't know any more than anybody else does what will actually happen, but I really think we need to be prepared for the possibility that, and nothing just because it happened yet, that we are in the clear. We are living in volatile and dangerous times, and we need to be prepared for that. Which leads me to my second insight, which is that those who have embraced the big lie are governed by an anger based in fear, which generates fear in others. It's easy for those of us who consider ourselves somewhat educated and enlightened on issues of race to think of those who see such situations so differently than us as ignorant or deluded or stupid or evil. Thinking of them that way makes it very easy for us to be dismissive of their concerns. It causes us to overlook and minimize the fact that a lot of those folks who buy into the big lie do so out of fear, a fear that's constantly being stoked by politicians and media personalities. Black and brown people, immigrants, LGBTQ folks, and white liberals who support them are threatening to many people's way of life and way of thinking of, of the country. And they are scared. And when people are scared, they can turn violent and angry and are tempted to strike out and strike back. And they cause fear in others. I, I would be lying to you if I didn't admit my own fear. As I said, I have a blog and occasionally I get responses that can only be called hate mail, that degrade me, that call me all sorts of names and sometimes even threaten me. So we, we have to come to terms with the fact that so many of us on all sides of the issues are being driven by fear and understand that, that, that it, the, the fear we have is, is mirrored by the fear that those with whom we disagree. And when people respond out of fear, they do not act in ways that move toward healing and reconciliation. That fear leads to anger and it only can lead to the kind of violence that we saw at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina, the mass shootings in El Paso and Dayton, Ohio, the attack on the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, the Pulse Nightclub, Levin Oak, Orlando, and so many other places. And so we must realize that we are living in a time when people are really afraid and need to be able to respond to that fear. This then leads to my third thought, which may seem counterintuitive based on what I just said about fear, but I truly believe that we who are concerned about the growing racial polarization in our society need to move out of our sort of progressive relational bubbles to broaden our understanding. On the one hand, we need to find ways to be actively involved in solidarity and support with those groups who are seeking to work for greater ac access and equity for people of color in our society, fair, fair access to jobs, to good education, to healthcare and housing, these things that are so denied to so many people in our society. But at the same time, we have to be willing to enter spaces with those white people whose views are vastly different than our own and engage them in honest conversation. We, we have to muster the courage to engage those who've bought into this big lie and we have to do so with love. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's essential. In disrupting whiteness, I, I challenge all of us, especially those of us who are white, um, to engage with those other folks in conversations about race and to do so without hostility, to take a dialogical approach, 
to explore the stories behind why people think the way they do and feel the way they do and act the way they do when the topic of race comes up. And it may start by simply holding these folks by name up in prayer, or as Quakers say, holding them in the light, asking for compassion and insight on how to approach people with this conversation, uh, <clears throat> to approach it with a sense of curiosity, to understand why people believe they, as they do and how they come to, came to see the world as they do. It's not about debate, it's not proving them wrong, but understanding and building bridges. And as we build bridges, we build trust. And over time, that trust can lead people to reflect on this misplaced values and fears that they have. My fourth thought is that while we are engaging those who see things differently than us in this way, at the same time, we have to be committed to speaking out and affirming the truth of what is going on. Shortly after January 6th, I wrote three friends of mine who I knew were strong Trump supporters. And I simply asked them this question, how do you interpret the events of January 6th? How do you interpret the events of January 6th? And the responses I got back were so bizarre, I was speechless. You know, one, one guy said, it, oh, it was Antifa who did it. Another person said, oh, the police set them up. The police were, you know, it was, it was a total stage set up by the police. Someone else said, oh, it wasn't a riot. They were just touring the Capitol. And I, I realized then and continue to realize that these folks were caught up in a totally different reality than I was. In, in a poll that was taken shortly before the 2022 midterm elections, it was found that 61% of registered Republicans still believe that Donald Trump had had the election stolen from him in 2020. That's 29% of all American voters. That's millions of people still subscribe to this alternate reality. Sarah Longwell, who's a <clears throat> journalist for the Atlantic Magazine, has conducted focus groups with people who believe that the 2020 election was stolen. And what she learned is that while people often are, are kind of short on details on why they believe what they do, they weren't, in other words, they weren't sure how the election was stolen, but they know something nefarious happened. And they're confused and angry why others can't see why what they know to be true, why can't they can't they see it? And Longo goes on to say, that we need to realize there are people in our society who have bought into this alternative reality. And she writes, these voters are not bad or unintelligent pe people. The problem is the big lie is embedded in their daily life. They hear from Trump aligned politicians, their like-minded peers and MAGA friendly media outlets. And from these sources, they hear the same false claims repeated ad infinitum. This being the case, it is essential that we be a caring alternative voice to the lies that are being spread. Our relationships and our concern and our concern for the truth may be the one thing that can reach them. I shared some of these thoughts with a friend of mine. She said, you know, it reminds me about how you rescue people from cults. And one of the key things that you, you do when you try to reach people who are caught up in a cult is you don't try to convince them they're wrong. You just tell them how much you care about them and you're gonna stand by them. And, and it's, it's that, that relationship, that care, that may lead people to at least listen to what we have to say. And there, that being said, there will come times, come a time with some folks that we can make no headway. And so then the key is not so much that we have to change their minds, but we try to limit their influence, to challenge their alternative facts, and when necessary, confront ac acutely and overtly racist attitudes and actions. Finally, I believe that in order to contend with those caught up in the big lie, we must develop and deepen our spiritual fortitude. This work involves resisting those who would pass laws and enact policies that are clearly racist. In, in the run-up to the 2022 midterm elections, we saw laws passed that made 
voting less accessible to the elderly, to the poor, to people of color. We saw attempts of legislators to gain power to reverse the outcomes of elections. And we saw candidates claim before one vote was cast that if they lost, they would not abide by the election results. We are in the battle for the soul of our nation. And to stay in this battle, we must say, stay spiritually grounded. It's, it's not just about doing a few good acts or sending money to an organization or writing an op-ed or a blog. It's something that goes to the very core of who we are as people of faith and conscience. Our worship, our prayers, our co contemplative and mindfulness practices can and must equip us for the struggles that lie ahead. In a biblical sense, we are engaged in what the Apostle Paul's uh, a battle against the principalities and powers, that we are involved in something that is bigger than any one of us and needs to involve all of us. We need to stay grounded. So these are the thoughts and questions that I've grappled with over the few, last couple of years. And I invite you to, to think with me and share your own thoughts in seeking how we proceed in these polarizing times. Are we leading to heading up toward a civil war? And if so, how do we respond? How do we respond to the fear that grips millions of people committed to the big lie? And how do we come to terms with our own fears that mirror theirs? How can we move out of our relational bubbles to both stand in solidarity who are most directly hurt by systemic racism and while at the same time engage those who've embraced the big lie? In, a comp in compassionate conversations. What does it mean for us to be committed to conveying the truth of what is going on, even in the midst of all the distortion and facts and, of re and, and distortion of reality itself? And how can we deepen and strengthen our spiritual fortitude in the face of so much hostility, so much fear, and so much untruth? You know, one of my heroes in this work and realm of anti-racist work is someone probably familiar to many of you, a Quaker by the name of John Woolman, who lived in the 1700s at a time when Quaker landowners had slaves working on their farms and in their homes. Even William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, the master of, uh, architect of the great experiment, owned several slaves. At the age of 23, John Woolman, became convinced that the enslavement of black people was not only cruel, but it, it ran directly against his values and his beliefs as a committed Quaker. And so as a young man, he dedicated his life to convincing those who shared his Quaker faith to release their slaves and allow them to live as free men and women. And for over 30 years, he went from house to house and farm to farm up and down the East Coast, as far south as North Carolina, as far north as Newport, Rhode Island. And while he at times spoke to large groups, most of his conversations were simply one-to-one, -one, sitting over a, a dinner table or over a cup of coffee, trying to convince these Quaker slave owners to release their slaves. And largely because of John Woolman's efforts, along with others who shared his convictions. In 1787, the Philadelphia Friends Meeting became the first religious organization in the United States to require its members to refuse to enslave other people. John Woolman stands as an example of what can be accomplished when we live and speak out our convictions in the face of gross injustice. He reminds us that even in the face of something as overwhelming as the big lie, truth and justice can prevail. We can prevail. And in this time of our nation's histories, our nation's history, I believe that is our calling as people of faith and conscience. And I thank you for listening and I look forward to our interaction and your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Drick, for sharing with us your experiences of composing the book and your experiences of considering what happened after the book was published. And um, I wanna invite 
those of us that are here to just take a moment of uh, mindful waiting worship as we begin to carefully compose questions and thoughts that we may share. Um, and in a moment, I'll share with you the guidelines for the Q&A. Thank you, friends. We do have some questions coming in in the chat. Um, and let me share with you um, how we'll move forward through the Q&A. There are two ways that you can ask a question. You can raise your electronic hand and you can find the raise hand function in the reactions button on your Zoom toolbar. When your electric hand is raised, I'll call on you and ask you to unmute to ask your question. And you can also send your question by chat to Anna Hill or me, if you'd like your question to be asked anonymously. Um, please note that we will be working to create parity and diversity and representation in the questions that are asked and who gets to ask questions. And of course, it's possible that not every question posed will be asked. We invite you to mindfully discern your question and do your best to keep questions succinct, knowing that there are almost 100 people in attendance and within the context of tonight's topic, talking to white people about racism in a time of polarization. If your question is very lengthy, I may interrupt you. <laughs> and finally, in the manner of friends, we will leave some time between questions and answers so those of us present can both process what we've heard as well as the questions that are forming within us. So thank you for building community by following these guidelines. And I invite you to raise your electronic hand or continue posting your questions in the chat. Janine Gardner. Hi, everyone. Hi, Dr. Boyd. Thank you so much for calling on me. I didn't expect to be called on first. <laughs> um, so my question is along the lines of what you talked about, uh, being surprised at the January 6th insurrection, and just more specifically, why you were so much surprised. I think there's a large social media presence where there's a lot of hate speech and talk of violence around that. So it seemed to have been building up for a long time. Um, so maybe give some thoughts around the surprise and that element around social media and its push for hate speech and violence um, and just what your thoughts are there. Yeah, I mean, in retrospect, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised given what you just said. I think um, I have been involved over the years in a lot of heated exchanges on a variety of issues. You know, I, I, was, I was a child of the 60s, so, you know, we argued a lot about the Vietnam War uh, and about race and about the environment and all sorts of things. But it never quite came to blows like that. And I think there were two things that, that you know, I, I, I think like a lot, a lot of Americans, I thought it would, it, you know, the rhetoric might be heated, but it would stop at rhetoric. You know, that eventually we, there was sort of this code that we could disagree, but 
uh, it wouldn't come to blows. Now, you know, if you know a little bit of our history, there have been times in Congress when people have gone after each other, you know, and Aaron, Bur Aaron Burr and Alexander Han Hamilton had a duel, you know, even. Um, so, you know, perhaps I, I was counting on something that I probably shouldn't have counted on. I think the thing that really blew me away was uh, the number of Congress people who didn't want to certify the election uh, on January 6th and created uh, an environment that only heightened uh, what eventually happened with the violence. Um, you know, we have, a, there's a sort of basic trust we have in the system that when all is said and done, when the election is over, if you win, uh, you win graciously. And if you lose, you lose graciously. And you, if you're an incumbent, you hand over the power. And of course, uh, for the years that he was president, there were a lot of things that Donald Trump didn't do that followed the, the normal pattern. And this certainly was part of it. Um, you know, and there's a lot of things that have come out uh, in, the, in the investigations, particularly the January 6th committee, that no one knew in terms of just how, how uh, um, orchestrated uh, this whole event was. Um, I don't think at the time anyone would have thought that, it, I think many, many of us, my, myself included, thought, well, it's kind of a spontaneous thing. People just kind of overtook people. Uh, but it, clearly it was more than that. So, um, you know, I think my comments about civil war kind of are saying, uh, yeah, I won't, be, I won't be fooled again by at least that kind of thing. But you're right. I, there were there certainly were signs. Certainly were signs. Thank you, Janine. Thank you, Drick. Going to ask a, a question that came in by chat. Can you drill down more on the big lie? How much of it is true, especially since most of the U.S. systems were designed for parts of the big lie to be true? The truth will disrupt these systems, and the people who are a part of the system and not a part of the system will be subjected to pain. What can we do as individuals? Um, can you read the last part of the question again? Uh, the second part, not the first part. The truth will disrupt these systems and the people who are a part of the system and not a part of the system will be subjected to pain. What can we do as individuals? Well, as individuals, and, and this is really kind of the focus of my book, is to look at those people in our relational circles, you know, that's why I say, you know, your social circle, your family, your work, your, your the people you work with. Um, I think that's, that's the arena we all should be looking at rather than just sort of talking to someone on the street, just that we don't know. Um, because the relationships are, can be transformative. You know, even if I disagree with you, if I trust you, if I, if I like you, I will listen to you. Um, and I think um, for those people in our, in our relational networks that seem to be uh, caught up in the big lie, um, it's just, I think we're the ones who have been called to, to address those things. I mean, the, we're the ones who are closest to them. Uh, now, in terms of what is the big lie, uh, what is it what I'm talking about? Well, I think, a lot of it has to do with the fact that, um, as I was, I was saying, a lot of people are driven by fear uh, about what's happening to our country and what what is it going to be like if if things begin to change. You know, when when after after uh, Michael Brown was shot and Black Lives Matter emerged from being just a hashtag to being a movement, uh, a lot of white people were extremely intimidated by that and um, started saying things like, well, all lives matter and police matter. And, you know, what, what are you, why are you saying black lives matter? And they weren't really hearing the message 
that for 400 and some years, black lives have not mattered. And, and those who were shouting and chanting those, those phrases were saying, hear me. It kind of reminds me uh, when Dr. King went to Memphis uh, just before he passed away, uh, he was there to uh, w- march with the garbage workers, uh, the African-American garbage workers who were be t- being treated unjustly by the city of Memphis. And uh, they had signs on them as they marched saying, I am a man, which is a way of saying, I matter. And the, the part of the big lie, which is not new in this day and age, but it is that somehow uh, white people as a group have had certain privileges and power that are not, not available to many other racial ethnic groups in our society, particularly black and brown folks. And, and that there, there are rights that they have that, that they should be able to enjoy. And so the big lie also is sort of covering up the fact that we as a society have not really addressed this. We keep thinking we have, but we haven't. And, and it's shown, there are all sorts of statistics, whether you're talking about education or healthcare or number of people who are incarcerated that show that they're skewed toward uh, oppressing and hurting those who are people of color and those who are poor. So um, I'm not exactly sure where the question was coming from, but those are some of the things I think about when I think about the big lie and what, what the big lie is trying to cover up. I mean, when people start screaming about not wanting folks to, to read um, you know, books on race or books on, on Hispanics or books on immigrants, uh, because somehow that's going to uh, upset the apple cart. It's really denying what's, what there, that there's, there's a part of our history that we haven't really learned and we haven't really gained from. And so um, to me, that's very important. And that's part of why I think challenging the big lie is, is so important. And if I haven't really addressed your question, please come back because I, I know it's a it's a big it's an important question. Thank you. And turning back to folks who have their electronic hands raised, Gabriela de la Sierra. Thank you for um, taking my, um, my hand. My name is, it's actually Gabriela Campos I'm from Peru. And um, it really struck me when you said um, some white people, um, like they feel like their values and white people are gonna be erased, uh, that the ways of, of white culture are gonna be gone. And all I could think about is, you know, colonizers coming to Latin America um, even in the 50s and 60s and obliterating so many social systems, creating terrorism in my own country that forced us to leave. And understanding that I also have some white privilege because I'm lighter skinned, right? So I occupy this weird space. Um, and all I can think about is that the saying that my grandmother had, un, un ladrón conoce a otro por su condición. A thief knows another one by their own behavior. And so you know, like to me, that sense of loss, like that something's gonna be stolen from them is because maybe they were willing to do it to others. Mm. And so I think that that's sort of the piece that we need to address. And I have a hard time personally, I, I don't have a lot of patience for white fragility, I'll be completely frank. And, and I don't like, I want help. And how do I frame that in a way that isn't so abrasive because I don't want to hurt other people, right? In expressing these frustrations, but I don't feel that we have a lot of time. I also see the urgency because there was a lot of political arrest when I was growing up and I see all of the things that are happening. And so, you know, like I, I come to you with your years of experience of like, what are some good ways to cut to the chase and, and help people understand that you know, we're going to sink if we don't work together um, without maybe ruffling too many feathers. Thank you for, for the question. A uh, couple of thoughts. The first would be, I think all of us have to know kind of where our levels of tolerance for discomfort 
and, and struggle is in, in this issue. Uh, there's no, no, no way that these conversations can be uh, without some anxiety and some discomfort. I, I don't, I think that's a, a given, but you know, depending on whatever, what else has happened in your life, if, if, if this triggers trauma or triggers other sorts of things, the first thing you need to do, I think, is be able to monitor yourself and be in, in, be aware of your own self-care. Because I think um, there, there's a lot of harm that can be done without necessarily meaning to be done. And, and it also takes a certain awareness that in the same way, uh, those same things maybe happen to that person you're talking to. And that may, in fact, uh, be part of what's behind why they respond to you the way they do. Um, and it's, so that's the first thing, take care of yourself. The second thing is that I think um, we need to enter these conversations with, with a sense of trying to understand rather than trying to convince them to think differently. Um, the only person who can change a person is themselves. Uh, you know, I can't change you, you can't change me. But what I can do is I can raise questions and, and invite you to share what's going on with you behind what you're feeling about race or about a particular issue and, and invite you to sort of talk about what's going on with you and why you think or feel, feel the way they do. What's the story behind it? In, in Nucora, we talk a lot about drawing out the stories uh, that are behind what people think and feel. And that can be done without, uh, without criticizing someone, just saying, I really want to understand. Let me give you an example. I have, uh, during this past election, uh, my front yard was plastered with uh, uh, placards for all the Democratic candidates. And I have, I have a neighbor just happened to live around the corner who plastered their uh, front with all the Republican candidates. And I, I said to my wife the other day, I said, that's a conversation we need to have. OK, and when I when I engage that conversation, it's not going to be, oh, why'd you vote for those people? Uh, but rather to acknowledge, first of all, you've seen some of my signs. I've seen yours. So we're obviously on different side, sides of the issue. Can you explain to me why you feel the way you do, why you think the way you do? And 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 part of what I'm banking on is that I've had a lot of conversations with them about other things. You know, we both have dogs, we talk about our dogs, and we both have kids, and we all talk about our kids. So that, that I, this is just another, obviously more difficult thing, but something that we can engage in, in a way that doesn't necessarily uh, lead to us, you know, wringing our hands or fists at each other. Um, and, and so, in, in the book, that's what I'm really uh, trying to encourage us to do is to figure out how to ask good questions. Um, I have a brother-in-law and we don't see the eye to eye on a lot of political issues, but he's, he asks great questions of me without trying to convince me. And I can ask questions to him and all the rest of my family are worried we're gonna end up in blows, but we end up having this great conversation because we've, we've, we've gone past just our positions to who we are as people. And that's really what um, I'm inviting us to do is to, with these people who are in our relational networks, how can we, um, how can we engage them to try to understand why they think and act the way they do uh, around these issues? Um, it's not easy and it doesn't always work. And it certainly is not something that's a one and done. It's, a, it's an ongoing process. Um, but it, it builds bridges and that's the most important thing. I think transformation happens because people choose, but also if we can set the conditions that help them think through those things, um, they, they will choose to change on their own when they're ready. Thank you. Um, this next question is a little bit of a mashup between a bunch of questions that have come in by chat. And that is, um, do you have some um, recommendations for 
training or preparing or building confidence for talking with those who believe in the big lie? Well, uh, I think the first thing is we need to know what we're talking about. I mean, a lot of these conversations are just us sharing our ignorance around things. And, um, and so I think, you know, know, know what it is you're talking about. I mean, if, if, it, if, if you have facts, know where those facts come from. Are those reliable? Um, and, and, and so that's, that's certainly being, being important is that to know, to know what you're talking about. Um, and not just sort of voice your opinions, but have, have it be based in something that uh, you can point to. Uh, the, the, the last point I made in my talk about being spiritually grounded, I think is, is really critical. Um, this, um, I mean, I, <laughs> I have a regular practice of meditation. Uh, I have a regular practice of uh, engaging in worship. Uh, I, I have, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian, so I, I read the scriptures and I read, I read them these days. I try to read them through a lens of anti-racism. You know, what might this passage have to mean about engaging in issues of, around race? Um, now that's my practice and other people can have other practices, but, uh, I think, um, uh, before we, uh, launch out on this, I think we really need to be grounded and, and continually uh, return to thinking about uh, why we think and feel the way we do. And, and frankly, sometimes we're going to screw up. And instead of kicking ourselves for not being perfect, use that as a, as a learning experience. Uh, I often would say to my students when I was teaching, I said, the reason I'm so smart is I make so many mistakes and I learn from them. Um, I'm not perfect. And, um, and, and I think too often, in, especially in issues like this, uh, we, we, f we, we feel like we got to get it right before we can speak. I, I, you know, I, I have a lot of people who say to me, well, you know, I, I just don't know if I can say this right out. I may not do it right. And, and, and so they don't. And so they never know if they did it right or not. Right. Um, and so, you know, there's a certain amount of just testing the waters, um, you know, you know, and you don't take the, the hardest person to convince for your first conversation. You know, you take someone that, you know, maybe you agree on 75% and you just miss the 25%. Um, this is a practice skill. Uh, Steve Lawrence is here. He's the head of Nucor, and he can tell you, uh, you know, he, we, 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 we practice this all the time and um, sometimes we don't get it right, but you know, that's, that's part of it. The, you know, having people you can have these conversations with that uh, then gives you confidence to, to uh, may engage in the more difficult ones. So I would say, you know, know your facts, be spiritually grounded and be willing to learn from both your successes and your, and your mistakes. Um, it's, I, I mean, that's, that, that's what I've done. I mean, as I said, I've made more mistakes than I care to count. Um, but I've tried to learn from them. Thank you. Um, going back to folks that have their electronic hands raised, John Shuford. Thank you very much. And thank you, this has been very informative and I look forward to uh, reading your book. Um, I think what's really important to me is that we don't play whack-a-mole. Mm. We take a look at the, the big lie, we take a look at these other things, they're just symptoms. And one of the things that I think is really important is for us to get to know ourselves. Mm. You know, when you talk about white culture, you know, we say, well, that's just American. Well, trying to educate somebody about white culture is like trying to convince a fish about the concept of water. You're in it, you have nothing to base it on. 
Um, we've been reading a book and taking, participating in a group called Confronting Whiteness. And this was started, I don't know if you've heard of it, started by Ben Boswell, a Baptist minister in Charlotte, North Carolina. And his premise is, if you want to learn about whites, don't ask whites, ask blacks. <laughs> because blacks have had to deal with whites and blacks, and they know about whites better than whites know about whites. And what he does is he creates this workbook that is purely black authors. James Baldwin is the very first one that you start with. And it has just been really eye-opening for me because I need to learn about me, about my white superiority um, culture that I grew up with. There's another book called Me and White Supremacy. This is where I think it's important for us to start. Um, so, because that's at the core, finding out about us. And yes, we can know about racism. Yes, we can know about the, uh, the slave patrols and all that stuff from the police. That's all good to know. But what's really important today is for us to learn about ourselves. And I would highly recommend that workbook. You can get it online, Confronting Whiteness by Ben Boswell. Um, and the whole workbook is Black authors. And I think we can learn one heck of a lot from that. So thank you. I think what you're saying is very important. But I also don't want to play whack-a-mole and get, if we're talking about races and white supremacy, and here in North Carolina, obviously, that's that lives pretty pretty much today, um, then we've got to learn about ourselves and we will learn best by reading black authors. So thank you for this presentation. Yeah, John, thank you. And I, I would just uh, second what you said. I'm not familiar with the Boswell book, but I will check it out. The Me and White Supremacy I've, I've read. Um, and there are, are a number of um, wonderful books and authors uh, that I think can be very helpful to us. So yeah. I think you're right on target. Thank you, friends. I just want to pause for a minute because I noticed, um, well, I'll start by saying that in my own anti-racism journey, as I've uh, come to terms with my own whiteness, I've had to learn to pay attention to what's happening in my body. And what I think is aligned very much with Quaker practice, sit with it for a while. And I noticed some discomfort with the term whites and blacks in particular. Um, so I'm pausing and I'm noticing some discomfort. And I'm, and I'm wondering about that. And noticing that I feel more comfortable um, using terms that are clearly identifying people as people. Um, the words that we use are imperfect. They will always be imperfect. And as we pause and, and think about how we talk about an issue like this where people can be harmed, I encourage all of us to continue to be really mindful about the language that we choose to use when we engage in these discussions. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to another question that came in in the chat. Um, who should initiate these conversations? Who does the responsibility fall on to begin the discussion? For marginalized people, it can be a very vulnerable space to engage, initiate with those who have degraded or devalued them. Um. Yes, that, that, first of all, let me affirm that, that comment. Uh, and why in the book, 
I, uh, I am primarily speaking to, to white people uh, for specifically for the reasons you just, you just mentioned or the questioner just mentioned that there is um, a level of vulnerability uh, for a person of, of color uh, who has experienced the, uh, the harm that microaggressions can cause, that systemic racism can cause, that seemingly innocent actions or comments, but harmful nonetheless can cause. So I don't, in the, in the book, in, in, in my, my focus is primarily on, on white people initiating these conversations with other white people. Now that doesn't exclude or say that, uh, you know, a, a BIPOC person shouldn't do it. Uh, I certainly, you know, what, and what I've, in, in my conversation with my friends and colleagues of color, I, I hear some people say, you know, I'm tired of trying to teach white people about racism. I don't want to, I don't want to be responsible for teaching white people about race. Uh, you know, I have to deal with it every day. And there's some days I, I can't even, you know, I don't even want to think about it, but I, I can't help it because when I walk out my door, you know, I'm not seen as just who I am, but I'm, I'm categorized because of my, my skin color or my ethnicity or what have you. Um, so for that reason, I would say, yeah, I, uh, this is not, this is not primarily the work for you. And on the other hand, I have, I have known uh, persons of color who in a sense kind of see it as their part of their mission, their calling to talk with white people about these issues. And I'm certainly not going to tell them not to, um, but clearly in, in my book and what I, even my talk here tonight, my primary focus is on white people talking to white people. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is that if we are concerned about racism in our society, then it behooves us to initiate the conversation because it's not going to come up usually in predominantly white spaces. And I've had a number of experiences where I've gone to a, you know, a social gathering of some sort or, you know, a faculty meeting of some sort and everybody in, everybody in the room is white and I'll, something will have happened in the, in the news or that day. And I'll say, well, what do you think about such and such? And I can tell you I can, I, how quickly things change. It's like people just change the subject or they walk away or in some cases, you know, because they know who I am and I know I tend to bring these sort of difficult questions up. Why are you doing that? You know, why are you doing that now? Um, but I, I, I see it as, as if we're concerned about racism, then we've got to, we've got to talk about it. And if we, because if we don't talk about it in most predominantly white spaces, White people are not going to talk about it unless they're going to tell racist jokes or something. Because um, and that's the other thing that happened. There's a phrase that's used for back, called backstage racism. I forget the author who coined it, but basically, you know, when they're in public settings and work settings, they're you know, everybody's together. But when they get with their buddies, you know, that's when the other stuff comes out. And um, and it, you know, if a if a if a black or brown person is in that room, they're probably not going to hear that. But if it's all white people, they will hear that. Um, in the book, I tell a story. I was, I was going to this community basketball game, and it was the first time I'd ever gone to this place. And it was all white guys playing basketball. And there was one guy there who obviously was new as well, um, who made some racist comments uh, about how we were playing basketball or something. And I can't remember the specifics. But I was so impressed. One guy who obviously was a leader in the group, he stopped the game and he looked right at the guy and said, listen, if you're going to play here, we don't talk like that. Now, that, that was that was really courageous on his part. But that's the kind of thing that I think those of us who can, are con, truly concerned about racism, we need to be willing to talk about those issues when necessary, confront those issues, uh, because otherwise it will it will just pass by and everybody will think, well, it's OK. You know, just so and so, they're just talking that way. We'll just let them be. Uh, and one of the things that I think it's important for us to be able to do is to say, "Hey, let's let's talk about why you said that, and let's let's go be." And and so it's not just about condemning people, but it's also about helping them think about what they're what they're saying. Um,
Thank you. Um, back to the folks who have their hands up. Lolly, am I saying that right? Yes, thank you, Lally. Thank you so much. It's good to be here with you all. Um, I have been nominated to my congregation's board of leadership in the Episcopal Church. We call that the vestry. And I'm interested, Drick, both from your own experience and also from perhaps what you know about John Woolman's experience, how one goes about drawing on one's um, shared religious tradition when one is talking to folks who self-identify as being within that circle, how we can draw on, on, on those resources to have these conversation. I, I live on Cape Cod. My congregation that I belong to is predominantly older folks like me, predominantly almost exclusively white folks like me. And I know that I don't know how many have endorsed the big lie, but I do know that about a third of our congregations, congregations, congregational membership voted for that president the first time around. We are therefore politically divided and yet we worship together several times a week. And I can't quite wrap my head around it. <laughs> I don't understand how those other folks reconcile those things. And I would love some suggestions about how to gently and with love and compassion have those kinds of conversations. Great question, great question. Um, first of all, I guess I want to affirm the fact that you are in a congregation that is politically divided because so often we, we, we kind of go to our own group. And I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm part of a Mennonite church where, uh, you know, we don't have that, uh, mm -hmm. that division. So mm -hmm. it, it can- The mix is blessing, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously you're feeling the tension of that. You know? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I guess I want to affirm, first of all, that you're there, you know, mm -hmm. that you haven't chosen some other place to go. Mm. Uh, um, Thought about it. <laughs> certainly, certainly. Um, and I guess I would try to frame it as an opportunity mm. rather than a problem. Uh, because, I mean, you your situation is a little bit like me and my neighbor, you know, that, mm -hmm. um, that on many ways we are very compatible and very friendly with each other. And so you have, you have that, uh, that to, to build on. So that's the first thing I would say. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, different, uh, different traditions have a way of sort of engaging these kind of issues, you know, I mean, whether it's Bible study or reading a book together or uh, having a forum of some sort. And, but I think first, you know, you've acknowledged that I, I'd be curious how others in your congregation would, would see that situation. I mean, it's, it's just, it seems to invite a very interesting question is, you know, we're not all on the same political page and yet we're all here in the Episcopal church and we love each other and we worship together and we pray together. So where does that come into play? Um, now, you know, let's, let's be honest at the same time, the Christian church has been perhaps the greatest, greatest purveyor of racial injustice, certainly in the United States, if not the world. And of um, Christian, and of Christian nationalism. Yes. Which goes yeah. a long way. Yeah. 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 And, and that, is, that, is a, that is a reality that we have to contend with, that um, so many things that we you know, were referring to in our history uh, would not have happened were it not for Christians somehow justifying it um, in the name of their God. Um, so, you know, I think, so 
I think you you have a you have an opportunity to just to sort of acknowledge, you know, hey, we're so let's talk about this. Why why do we come why do we come at this differently than others? And you know, you don't know, and I certainly don't know what kind of reaction you get. You know, you people might go crazy, you know, get really angry. Um, but it's certainly the the uh, the elephant in the room, or one of them, <laughs> that the fact you have this conversation con- congregation um, that is is a could be a very pregnant kind of conversation, but it but it is difficult, and I think you need, uh, as I was saying earlier about the earlier question, is taking care of yourself. What can you handle, and when, and how? Um, but it's a uh, what we have, what we have are people, people uh, who were, in my experience, mostly the people who are supporters of the former president saying, oh, we shouldn't even talk about this because it's just going to divide us. And then we also hear people saying whenever the word, whenever race or racism are mentioned in church, which I bring up frequently, people say politics doesn't involve, doesn't belong in church. So our, our differences are it's like our, our differences are more structural mm. than, mm. than they even are conceptual or political. I mean, it's, it, it's a profoundly different understanding of what it means to be church. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, uh, does the, does the Episcopal church, you know, the, the broader denominator, does it have resources that you could draw on? I mean, I think. Yes, there, it does. Mm-hmm. There's several levels to this. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I, one of the one of the people that I wrote the my little letter to after January six was my nephew, and part of his response uh, also included. I think he was the one who said it was Antifa, but then he also went and said, "You know that has nothing to do with our faith." And I I, I said, "Well, you're a theology professor. What theology are you teaching? Because you know the God I God we supposedly both worship is the God of all things, you know, of all people." So. Um, you know, I think there are ways in which you can engage that at a deeper level and, and not let people just sort of get away with, oh, we don't want to talk about it. Um, of course, we don't want to talk about it because it's something that's traumatized our, our nation, but we got to talk about it. Mm, 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 thank you. You know, you know part, of, part of one of the things I didn't get into detail, but one of, one of the things that's going on with a lot of white people is trauma. Is that's trauma. Right. This, this is, we have been socialized as white people in in large part to see as see this whole conversation of race or people who look differently than us as a threat. Mm-hmm. And it's been reinforced. And, and, and so, you know, you're, you're also coming up against some really uh, deep hurt that has been transferred perhaps through generations in families. So to, to that, just quickly, uh, re- uh, some uh, resources, Resma Menachem's book, uh, um, My Grandmother's Hands, and then he's got a subsequent one. And also a man named David Campt, a man of color, has written, a, uh, has an organization called the Dialogue Company. Mm-hmm. And he focuses, as you do, on uh, cues, mostly for white people, about how to build relationships with folks that we know are on the other side on this topic, but how to build those relationships in order to open a space for conversation and connection. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I'll say amen to both those resources. Lolly, thank you for that, and and Drick as well. Um, The time is 8.55. It's clear to me that we're not going to get to all of the questions, and I'm I'm sorry because um, I feel like I could be here for many more hours engaged in this. Um, But I want to let you know that I'm going to post some of the resources that friends have been sending us in the chat I'm going to post some of those, um, and I want to end with one question and give us a time limit of about three minutes, um, and that is, Drake, if you could say a little bit more about reparations efforts in Philadelphia, and I'm actually going to point, before you get into your answer, um, I'm going to point people to two programs at Pendle Hill is sharing with friends and it just ran out of the words. I think we're going to post some um, links in the chat, but at the end of January, we have Exploring Quaker Commitment to Reparative Justice. Um, 
And we also have a program titled Aiming for Justice, Race Reparations and Right Paths. And that's a, a program that Pendle Hill has been engaged in for quite a while and does require participants to um, pledge funds as part of their participation. So Drick, if you can talk a little bit about in limited time, um, what reparations efforts um, you're aware of, and I'm gonna post some resources in the chat for friends. Well, the, the workshop and program that I'm a part of this week um, is sponsored uh, by a group called the Truth Telling Project, which was, is a group that was founded after the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, and what they do is uh, really uh, walk you through the history of reparations and then uh, the psychology behind it. And um, eventually uh, on the fourth day, uh, we're, it's a faith-based uh, approach. So there are groups from various faith traditions and faith congregations, actually. Um, they'll actually talk on the fourth day about what does that look like for us. Um, in Philadelphia, what's interesting about this program is Naomi Washington Leapart, who works for the uh, works for the city and the faith-based initiatives, is she's really looking at what what can reparations look like for Philadelphia, and and so she's talking about how can we address uh, inequities, uh, uh, economic inequities, educational inequities in our city, and through a reparative process and. Um, it's a broad definition of reparations that it includes money, but includes a lot more in terms of sort of addressing the, the harms through history and, and how we as congregations can be a part of the healing process. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an ongoing thing, it's emerging. So um, where it ends, I can't tell you. I'm, I'm kind of on the train, not sure where it's going, but I'm, I'm glad I'm on the train, so. Thank you, Drick. Friends, we've come to the end of our time together tonight. I want to express uh, my regret at not being able to take everybody's questions. Also my great joy in being here with you all tonight in community as we continue to um, be mindful of the role that we, that, that we as especially white friends can play um, as we address the harm that racism has done to people of color and to white people in our culture. Many, many thanks to Drick for joining us tonight. You can find a link to purchase his book um, in the chat, but also on Pendle Hill's website. We hope that you do and use that as a resource in your work. Um, and I invite everybody to close um, with a moment, a minute of closing worship. With deep gratitude, everybody, good night, be well. We'll see you next time. Thank you all.
Anna and Lori, thank you very much for all you did. That was very good. That went very well. Thank you, Drick. It went smoothly. Yeah, thanks, Drick. Have a great night, everybody. Be well, friends. Drick, you'll get an email from me um, so that we can hear your feedback on, on how things went in a more official manner. Sure. Okay. Yeah, and I should have mentioned there were a lot of friends at this meeting I was at today. There were a lot of friends. Yes. In fact, uh, one of the one of the leaders, uh, whose name is escaping me at the moment, is a member of Green Street Friends, who, who uh, which the congregation actually done some reparation work, so they have uh, they're a good example. So. They are, and I'm I'm proud to say that's my monthly meeting. Oh. <laughs> so oh. Well, okay. I'm not on the reparations committee. But um, yeah, those friends are, they're my spiritual community. Okay, great, so, great, oh, wonderful. Yeah.